Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, if you're on the West Coast like I am, or good afternoon if you are on farther east. My name is Dr. Saki Malik Cho, and I'm the Director of Research Policy and Health Promotion here at the National Center for Health and Public Housing. And I am going to be acting as moderator today. On behalf of NCAPH and our panelists and HRSA, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, A Public Health Approach to Addressing the Opioid Epidemic and Substance Use Disorders in Public Housing in Rural Communities. As many of you all are aware, um, rural communities and those with public housing face some major barriers to treatment for substance use disorders, and some of those can include limited resources and lack of transportation. So the goal of this webinar is to explore some of the federal and local efforts to address some of those challenges and the role that health centers can play in improving access to treatment. Um, in case you aren't familiar with the National Center for Health and Public Housing, our mission is to strengthen the capacity of federally funded health centers that are located in or immediately accessible to public housing. And we do that by providing training and technical assistance through research and evaluation and um, services to build outreach and collaboration. We work directly with health centers and housing agencies to improve access to care and quality of care to ultimately improve um, the health of, uh, outcomes of public housing residents. Oh, I don't know if Okay. Um, so we are we have a cooperative agreement with HRSA, the Health Resources Services Administration Bureau of Primary Care, to provide training and technical assistance. So it's with their support that we're able to have this webinar. But I must note that while we do receive funding from HRSA, the opinions that are expressed here are our own and do not reflect those of the bureau. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some housekeeping items. I'd like to let you know that we are recording this webinar, um, but we will plan to have the slides and the recordings available on our website after this is over. Because we are recording, we've muted all of your lines, but we would really like to encourage you to use the chat function to ask questions or make comments throughout the presentation. We are going to have a formal Q&A portion at the end of the presentation where we'll review any of those questions that you made through the chat. You also have the option to raise your hand and ask a live question. Just click the raise hand icon. I will announce when the line has been unmuted so you can ask your question. So we're looking forward to having some really great panelists um, and great discussion with you. The learning objectives that we have outlined include um, to discuss the impact of the opioid epidemic and substance use disorders in rural and public housing communities, to review um, federal and local efforts to address the opioid crisis in rural public housing communities through prevention, intervention, and treatment service and support. And the third is to identify best practices to address substance use disorders in rural public health com communities. So to accomplish that, we have some really great speakers today, and I'm so um, grateful that they were able to take some time from their day to, to be with us. The first is Fraser rothenberg Burns. I had the pleasure of working with Fraser a long time ago, and so I'm really glad that um, she's able to uh, collaborate with us on this. Uh, it only took 10 years <laughs> for us to work together again. So Fraser is currently a public health analyst in the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy at HRSA. She leads the evaluation of the Rural Communities Opioid Response Program, or RCOP. That's a, a portfolio of over 300 awards to address substance use disorders in rural communities. She has over 12 years of experience in research evaluation and health policy, specifically focused on vulnerable populations. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Dr. Hector Santos, who's the Director of Behavioral Health Services at Cosma Health Center in Puerto Rico. Dr. Santos received his medical degree from the University of Puerto Rico. He has had a long and distinguished career as an academic professor, a commissioned captain, a commander in the U.S. Army Health Clinic, a medical officer for the U.S. Army Reserve. He currently serves as the coordinator for a program where he evaluates and treats persons with dependency with psychotropic drugs. Finally, we're going to have, hear from some providers at a health center in Arkansas called Arcare. Frank Vega is a licensed marriage and family therapist in Arkansas, Kentucky, and Texas, and he's worked in the behavioral health field for more than 25 years. 
We tell various positions from provider to state agency level director for both Texas and Arkansas. He received his master's in family psychology from Hardin Simmons University in Texas and currently serves as the director of behavioral health for our care and Kentucky care. Um, Elizabeth Fleming is a licensed clinical social worker, a licensed clinical alcohol and drug counselor, and a certified substance abuse professional. She's had over 14 years of experience working in the mental health and substance use field. Elizabeth has spent most of her career working with individuals with co-occurring disorders, including adolescents, DUI offenders, federal probation officers, and individuals receiving medication for opioid use disorders. So we have some really great panelists, um, and we are going to start with Fraser. Fraser, just let me know when you want me to advance your slides. Excellent. Thank you, Saki. Um, it is fun, as Saki said, to collaborate with her again, even remotely while she's in California. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Fraser Byrne. Um, as Saki mentioned, I'm from the office of um, from the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, which is located um, here at the Health Resources and Services Administration in Rockville, Maryland. You can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, for those who aren't super familiar with the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, I wanted to provide a quick orientation. Um, as I mentioned, we are located within HRSA, which aligns well with our safety net and vulnerable populations mission shared with HRSA. Um, and our office takes on a dual role across HHS. We have a policy role where we advise the secretary of HHS on policy issues. And we also administer grant programs like other HRSA bureaus you may be familiar with. Um, and because we're a federal office, we advise the secretary and the department specifically on rural issues. Um, we are the voice of rural communities across HHS. They have unique opportunities and challenges that are not always addressed in other research and grant programs. Um, so we, we pride ourselves on being that voice. To reflect our, min our mission, FORP celebrate, uh, collaborates sorry, with rural communities and partners to support programs and shape policy that will improve health in rural America. Um, I want to note in my limited time today, I'm going to focus on our office's newest opioids program, but I do want to mention that we have previously funded a number, a number of substance use disorder grants through our federal office of rural health policy, including um, rural health opioids program and a substance abuse treatment telehealth network grant program that um, you may be interested in as well. Next slide. Um, so we at the federal office have been concerned with the disproportionate impact of the opioid epidemic on rural populations. Uh, when we look at rural versus urban, we are often seeing greater health disparities in rural because of the unique challenges rural communities face. Um, so just to highlight these um, data points, basically higher rates of overdose deaths, higher rates of prescribed opioids, um, many confounding social determinants of health factors and rural workforce shortages across the board, uh, particularly with um, providers who can um, prescribe uh, buprenorphine or medication assisted treatment. Looking at these data points, we want to examine kind of why this is happening and how we can change it. So for example, in the case of overdose deaths, we see that uh, EMS may have to travel great distances to reach someone who is overdosed. There may be limited access to naloxone or um, overdose reversal medication in the community and few harm reduction initiatives, for example. Um, similarly, for the data on high prescribing rates, a few factors combine there to make that data important. Uh, rural work is historically labor intensive and injury prone. Rural populations are generally older than urban populations and pain medication is often prescribed to manage pain if they can't see a doctor frequently. Um, it's perhaps prescribed in larger amounts or um, in lieu of um, distance access to physical therapy or other kind of alternative pain medication, pain um, management methods. Um, so in response to all that, we've developed a comprehensive community-based approach called the Rural Communities Opioid Response Program. Next slide, please. Great, so um, the Rural Communities Opioid Response Program is a multi-year initiative to address barriers to access in rural communities related to substance use disorder, including opioid use disorder. Our core funds multi-sector uh, consortia to enhance their ability to implement and sustain SUD, OUD prevention, treatment, and recovery services in underserved rural areas. So this map is a, um, our current R-Core service areas to date. 
It was, um, our core was started with a $130 million appropriation in fiscal year 18, and it grew from there. So to date, we have awarded 157 million with more to award this fiscal year, as I'll show you in the next slides. Um, a quick plug for our, our core webpage. Um, this is a snapshot from it. Um, and it has a wealth of information about our core. I encourage you to go after this webinar, please, um, to find out more information about um, the grantees we currently have awarded, um, including our care, you'll hear more about, um, as well as kind of our coverage overall. We include uh, currently 1,117 counties across the country. Um, I will say we have pretty great coverage across the US. Um, which we're really happy about and um, obviously room to expand um, and provide more services to those in need in rural communities. So you'll also learn about um, the current funding opportunities on our website as well. Uh, next slide. Um, so our, our core portfolio include, um, is a multi-initiative program, as I said. Um, so here are the three grant types that have been awarded to date. So I'll start on the um, second column with planning. So these I refer to as getting the band together grants. So they are one-year grants um, to get multi-sectoral partners together to create a plan for addressing this epidemic in their community. Um, this often includes health centers, primary care, hospitals, behavioral health providers, as well as sheriffs, criminal justice, EMS, schools, et cetera. We really encourage a, a multi-sectoral approach. Um, we have awarded two cohorts of these grants already. Um, this graph should say um, for FY19, we did 120, not just 20 awards of this, but 120. And then we are projected to do another 50 um, to be awarded in September 2020. Um, and then um, for implementation, if planning is getting the band together, implementation is going on tour, if we're going to continue that um, lame metaphor. Um, so these are three-year grants to actually deliver the services. Uh, we dictate or we, we provide um, 15 core required prevention, treatment, and recovery activities that um, grantees must deliver as well as some additional option, optional activities that they can deliver as capacity allows. Um, these include medication assisted treatment, of course, but also peer support, care coordination, support services like connections to recovery housing in their community, other services and activities that are crucial for getting people in appropriate treatment, having them stay in treatment, and for supporting them through recovery. We have awarded 80 implementation grants total and are accepting applications now for 89 more awards um, that are scheduled to be awarded in September 2020. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, the third column is MAT expansion. This was a small pi pilot program we did in um, last year, fiscal year 19, to expand access to medication-assisted treatment, um, particularly in rural hospital or clinic settings. This was a three-year grant pilot. We do not anticipate more awards at this time for this program. However, for FY20, we have a new RCOR pilot, um, which is forecasted on grants.gov. All of this that I mentioned um, for September 2020 awards are all uh, forecasted on grants.gov. Um, and this new one, it, the new pilot is specifically for addressing neonatal absence syndrome in rural communities, which we are finding is um, a, large, a large issue in rural um, in particular. So um, we're really excited about that new uh, grant program in the works. Uh, next slide. Great. Um, and so as I mentioned, we are currently accepting applications for the FY20 cohort of implementation grants. Um, the applications are due April 24th. Uh, you can find more information on grants.gov. Um, the opportunity uh, number I wrote on the last slide, what is in here? Um, it is HRSA 20031 is implementation. Um, and the core activities here, award recipients will be implementing core SUD, OUD prevention, treatment, and recovery activities, as I mentioned before. Um, they're all outlined in the NOFO, um, the Notice of Funding Opportunity, sorry. Um, and applicants are encouraged to kind of tailor these models to address the unique needs of their communities. That's one of the things that we pride ourselves on um, is allowing that flexibility for you to tailor the activities to fit your community best. Um, 
And um, just a couple things to highlight here, I won't read everything, but um, the primary focus of these grants is um, opioid use disorder specifically, but we are um, in increasingly seeing um, instances of polysubstance use. Um, so we have expanded, um, there's some expansion of the focus to include uh, treatment of other, poly of other substance use disorders that are occurring um, in this upcoming cohort. And um, just a mention about sustainability, HRSA really finds it important to use this as seed money to continue these services after the grant period ends. Um, so that is an important part. Um, and in fact, for the implementation um, grants, there is a sustainability plan as one of the deliverables, one of the few actual deliverables for, um, for the grantees. Next slide. So um, in addition to the community grant program, uh, grants under our core, we also have um, a number of cooperative agreements that I'm just gonna run through very quickly. Um, we have uh, JBS International provides TA to all of our RCOR grantees. Um, along with the HRSA project officer, there is extensive technical assistance offered to our grantees um, to kind of meet them where they're at and encourage evidence-based practices, share lessons learned, um, create learning collaboratives. Um, there's our actually our on-site technical assistance three-day conference is next week. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity for, for that kind of um, growth for grantees. Um, and then there is an evaluation, which I lead, as Saki mentioned at the beginning, um, of the entire portfolio. Um, we're looking at the impact of our core initiative and um, evaluation tools and resources for use in rural communities in particular. And then um, there are three um, centers of excellence that I just wanna mention um, very quickly, and then I'll dive into one of them a little bit more closely since it relates to housing. Um, there are three focus areas for our centers of excellence. Um, one is uh, particularly innovative and effective treatment interventions for SUD. Um, that's out of uh, the Ber University of Vermont, including their hub and spoke model. Um, focus area two is the one I'll talk more about. Um, it's about best practices in recovery housing. And focus area three um, is addressing synthetic opioid, um, opioid related overdose mortality, um, particularly in Appalachia. Um, and that is um, the University of Rochester. Next slide. Um, and then, uh, so I, I did wanna just dive in a little bit more about the Centers of Excellence, um, just to give you all um, an idea of the opportunities here and resources at your disposal. So these are Centers of Excellence. They are um, basically technical assistance that is available to anyone. They have a specific areas of focus for rural communities, and some of them have actually identified specific counties or rural communities that they wanna target. Um, but their services are available to anyone outside of that area as well. So I just wanna reference that um, and offer, offer them up. Uh, I've provided the website for more information about them. And until they have a more um, uh, routine kind of way to, to request technical assistance, um, they've provided the, um, the PI's um, email addresses here to ask for um, technical assistance directly, which is pretty cool. So a little bit of um, background on them. Uh, so their focus area is best practices in recovery housing programs for SUD, particularly OUD intervention among low income, high risk individuals in rural communities. Um, and they are basing a lot of their work on um, their previous experience with recovery, recovery KY, um, obviously in uh, based in Kentucky, um, but it is, um, a really cool and established program um, where they have um, 18 facilities, each serving 100 or more residents for up to two years um, with a peer-driven and professionally supervised long-term recovery program. Um, and I encourage you to read more on the website. Um, they, are, they are targeting a number of uh, rural counties here. I've listed them out, um, but again, TA is available um, outside of those targeted areas. So I just wanna flag that. Um, and then next slide. 
And then this very busy and slightly overwhelming to me uh, timeline is all of the awards that have gone out for our core or our uh, schedule to go out for FY20. So um, we've created these grant cohort cycles. I think this visual helps just understand kind of the flow between planning and implementation. Um, so we created this grant cohort cycles between planning and direct service grants to to give some natural progression to awardees, but also to provide opportunities for incorporating lessons learned and best practices between cohorts on our behalf and um, for the grantees as well. We listen to the reviewers' feedback and we get feedback from the TA and evaluation providers um, for a quality improvement loop um, in order to improve the programs and um, provide better services to our grants. So I just wanted to put that plug in. And um, if you go to the next slide. So I've provided my contact information. Thank you all for your time um, and your interest in our core. Um, I've provided my contact information here along with um, some uh, with the um, link to uh, our core webpage and the general email box for our core, which is rural opioid response at hersa.gov. Um, and then the next slide is just um, here's more information about um, connecting with HRSA and various ways to connect with us and learn more about our agency and programs. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Fraser. It's always um, so great to hear about funding opportunities and all of the resources that you guys have available. Um, so thank you so much for your time. Next, we're going to hear from Dr. Santos to give us uh, the perspective in Puerto Rico. Dr. Santos. Good afternoon. Good morning to those who are morning. Uh, Speaking from sunny, warm Puerto Rico, <coughs> uh, from our island paradise. Uh, first, I want to start with the next slide, please, uh, with our mission and let you guys know a little bit about what we are about. Uh, COSMA is an, a federally qualified health center. We have been in this town in Cidra. It's a mountainous area of Puerto Rico. We're a rural community. And we have been here for uh, about 35 years. And basically what we do is provide a primary medical care. Through the years, we have been expanding our services. And at this time, we also provide mental health services uh, integrated within our primary care practices. But basically, we're a primary care facility that also provides mental health. We are currently working uh, with a SAMHSA grant for integration of mental health and physical health. And we encourage that our patients receive all their medical and mental health treatments here within our own facilities. Uh, we provide a, a great deal of facilities to our patients. We have dental clinics, general medical practice, pediatrics. We uh, have physical therapy. We have an endocrinologist. We do rheumatology, we have an allergist, a pediatric neurologist, and within our mental health services, well, we have uh, clinical psychologists, uh, so clinical social workers, uh, and we also provide psychiatric care, including pediatric psych psychiatry. But what I'm most interested in speaking to you about is our recent uh, intervention in the opioid epidemic. <clears throat> I began to work. I know Cosma since I've been a physician for the last 40 years because I had private practice here in this town. Uh, originally, all I did was pediatrics for my first 22 years of professional uh, endeavor. But during the last 18 years, I've only done uh, addiction medicine. And I was asked to come here four years ago so that we could uh, integrate mental health and physical health and begin to provide treatment for people in our community that have uh, substance use disorders for opioids. Right now, we don't provide services only in CEDRA, as we can see on the next slide. <clears throat> next slide, please. The next one, I already commented on that one. Next slide. This is the areas that are painted in yellow are the towns that we serve. We uh, serve at this time seven 
municipalities in Cedra. This opioid epidemic is not concentrated only in the large metropolitan areas. We have uh, big opioid dependence problems in basically all of our towns and all 78 municipalities of our island. And we try to provide uh, comprehensive treatment, at least for these seven municipalities where COSMA provides services to. So next slide, please. And these are some of the visuals of the clinics that we have right now. Cedra is the, where the, the clinics were founded, and then we started expanding uh, to the areas that we just saw in the map. Next slide, please. So what are we doing about the opioid epidemic? Next slide, please. So as I was saying four years ago, uh, we were asked to come in and provide medically assisted treatment for our patients, not just for opioid treatments, but we also provide MAP for uh, alcohol dependence and other uh, psychotropic drug use uh, in our communities. But mainly we were concentrated on the opioid epidemic and we started offering uh, treatment with the buprenorphine Right now, there are two physicians in our clinics that provide most of the treatment, but we have within our facilities 11 doctors that are wavered for buprenorphine treatment. So what we, our focus has been to integrate the treatment of, of substance use disorders within our primary care facilities. Another thing that we wanted to emphasize was reducing barriers to treatment for these patients and to change the perspective of our primary care physicians in regards to this disease. What we have emphasized is that it is a chronic disease and that anyone can have this disease and that the patients that we treat every day for, for other conditions may also have substance use disorders uh, within their, without their problems. So what we do is we have integrated them into our clinics. We don't separate our treatment for these patients. They have the same waiting rooms. They come in with, with their appointments just as any other uh, patient, and we treat them for their opioid uh, dependence. What we offer them is uh, uh, multidisciplinary uh, treatment. We have clinical social workers that are dedicated only to the patients that have substance use disorders. We have licensed addiction counselors that work in every one of our clinics. We provide psychological services for all of our uh, MAT patients. We have psychiatric services that are available to them should they need them. And as we know, a large number of our patients with substance use disorders also have comorbid psychiatric diagnoses. Our services are all integrated within our physical health and we encourage participants to have their PCPs physically within our facilities. We provide general me mental health and physical health services all under the same roof for all of our patients. Next slide, please. So, as far as MAD goes, specifically for, uh, for opioid uh, substance use disorders, we do toxicological testing for all, in all our visits, and we include fentanyl testing for every patient that comes in, because one of the main problems that we are having, especially with opioid overdose deaths, is due to the use of fentanyl. So we routinely test for 11 substances, including fentanyl. Uh, we have, we, what we do is we also have the drug monitoring, so we monitor the opioid prescriptions of our providers, particularly in the man management of pain issues, and we provide uh, education to all our PCPs in regards to treatment, particularly for chronic pain, pain patients. We do the inductions right within our facilities. We uh, have the patients come in and we do the buprenorphine inductions right here. 
And for those of them that have HIV uh, problems or diagnoses, we uh, have a program within our facilities called Atrevete, and we provide them also treatment for their HIV. Those patients that have he are test positive for hep hepatitis C, which is very frequent here on the island, uh, we see up to 80, 90 percent of patients that have been incarcerated uh, or have been in our prisons they come out of our prisons positive for hepatitis C, and we have a referral program for them to a program called CLETS here on the island uh, in San Juan, and they receive treatment for their hepatitis C infections. What we concentrate on is trying to eliminate all possible barriers for these patients to come in and be treated. So we do a lot of outreach. We have peer counseling. And our, our peer counselors also do outreach, and we uh, go out into the communities and inform these patients of the facilities that we have and the treatments we provide. We offer transportation services for those who cannot come in uh, or don't have transportation to come into our clinics. Our medication with buprenorphine is free of charge. Uh, we do that through a HRSA grant. And we also coordinate all their basic medical treatments with their primary care providers. Well, basically, that's uh, what we do here at COSMA uh, in the question and answer period, if there's any questions in regards to uh, our approach to the opioid epidemic and what we're doing about it, well, then we're here to answer any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Santos. And again, if you do have any questions, please enter them in the chat box. And we'll get to them in the Q&A session. Um, oh, here's Dr. Santos's uh, contact information. Um, next, we're going to have uh, Frank Vega and Elizabeth Fleming from Our Care. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning for you guys on the West Coast. Uh, my name is Frank Vega, and I'm the Director of um, Behavioral Health for Our Care. <clears throat> and I'm just going to speak for a few moments and then turn, it, turn our, the presentation over to Elizabeth. And I wanted to give you guys a little background on where Our Care, Kentucky Care, has, uh, has been and where we're going as a result of our, our Corp grant. And so we actually began uh, providing uh, medication-assisted treatment services in October of 2016. Uh, and from that, we have expanded into... Uh, three clinics here in Arkansas and one of our clinics in Kentucky, and Elizabeth will speak a little bit more to that. Uh, and we are uh, expanding into another one of our uh, clinics in, uh, in Arkansas as well. Um, when we first began to provide uh, medication-assisted treatment services or uh, part of the ramp-up to that, we actually contracted with Hazelton Betty Ford to provide us with some treatment around, uh, I'm sorry, some training around uh, their treatment approach, which is called the CORE 12, which is comprehensive opioid response plus the 12 steps. And so we have adapted their program, which is more residential based, uh, to really begin to meet the needs of uh, our community and the patients that we serve in our uh, health center. Um, currently, we have uh, 11 uh, physicians and APRNs that are data waived. Uh, about half of those uh, are currently providing services, and we have some uh, other physicians and APRNs uh, to serve as uh, coverage uh, in the event that uh, one of our physicians is out or um, that um, um, we, where we might have any physician or APRN turnover. Um, uh, in addition to uh, uh, the physician services, we also have um, uh, licensed clinical social workers that provide both um, services for our medication-assisted treatment program uh, programs and uh, general behavioral health care services. Um, and as Dr. Santos uh, talked about earlier, we also try to uh, provide integrated care uh, in some of our clinics um, uh, to ensure that we're addressing the, the entire need of the, of the person. Here recently, we've also added um, recovery coaches or peer support specialists to our programs here in Arkansas uh, and are going to be expanding that uh, service and making it available uh, through our R Corp grant uh, in uh, Kentucky. Um, one of the things that we've had the honor of being able to do is uh, 
here at our care is to per also provide a training um, and technical assistance to uh, many of our uh, sister organizations, our sister FQHCs across the state of Arkansas. Uh, last year in February of 2019, uh, we held a meeting and actually trained them on our approach and our um, how we implemented our medication assisted treatment programs um, across the serve our our entire service area. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth, who's going to speak more specifically about the R Corp. Uh, implementation grant um, and program uh, that we're developing in Kentucky. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, like Frank mentioned, I'm Elizabeth Fleming, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're actually doing here in Kentucky with our, our Corp implementation grant. So last year when we received the grant, um, to tell you a little bit about it, um, our mission for this consortium is to actually reduce the onset of substance use disorders and opioid use disorders to increase the awareness of harmful effects of substances, to host training, increase the access to highly qualified best practice treatment, and also to implement recovery-based models across Western Kentucky. Next slide, please. If you see here, um, the top part of it actually explains some of our consortium members. Um, again, Kentucky Care, we've also partnered with a local hospital and community mental health center and the Paducah school system. And our consortium is constant, constantly growing. Um, the map located on the screen also indicates the area that is our service area. We are in Western Kentucky and within our state, Western Kentucky is often um, limited on the resources and funding that they receive throughout the state. And the core measures table kind of indicates a little bit about our population, our service area that we're providing, and then also how there is a limited number of providers to provide medication-assisted services um, in our area. Next slide. So what are we doing? So again, we're concentrating on prevention, treatment, and recovery. So within the aspect of prevention, um, one part of it is actually trying to reduce the stigma that is in the area in regards to medication assisted treatment and then also in regards to Narcan and addiction in general. So, so far we've hosted two professional trainings. Uh, the first one was back in October and our physician, Dr. John Brazel, presented on the lessons learned in Western Kentucky and what we're actually doing here. During that presentation, he explained a lot about the Core 12 program, um, what we're seeing, how we're actually getting the individuals engaged in treatment, support groups and how the medication is actually um, a lifesaver for many of our individuals. During that presentation, we actually had 59 attendees and without, with 28 of them being MDs or DOs. In November, we assisted with the uh, Baptist Addiction and Compulsive Behavior Symposium. Uh, during that conference, we had 133 attendees and as you can see the breakdown, we had a wide variety of alcohol and drug counselors, Licensed professional counselors, psychologists, educational professionals, um, physicians, social workers, and just general audience. During that training, um, it was a really good breakdown as far as um, introducing ACEs to our area. Even though ACEs has been around um, the adverse childhood experiences for a very long time, Western Kentucky, again, is a little bit behind on um, their concept. So this is a really good way to actually introduce community members and individuals that attended that training to actually start incorporating some of the screenings to help individuals. Next slide, please. So um, naloxone training. So again, in our area, which I'm sure like most areas, there continues to be a stigma around the naloxone distribution. And um, the Opioid Task Force Community Assessment actually indicated that 47% of individuals um, in our area responded that they agreed or strongly agreed that Narcan should be administered to every individual experiencing an overdose every time. We are actually planning a Narcan training um, tomorrow, and I just want to kind of indicate a little bit about the stigma that's associated with Narcan in our area. One of our local news companies um, advertised the training that's going to be held. And they put it on Facebook, and then, of course, the Facebook comments um, completely went wild. And I'm just going to kind of read a few of these um, just to kind of illustrate 
how the stigma is in this area and how important education is um, in regards to the subject. So one comic is, um, addiction is not a disease. It was named that to rip off insurance companies. It's a choice. Wake up. I've been on both sides. Stop making excuses. I don't understand why is that a, oh, um, this presentation, I'll explain a little bit more about tomorrow, but we're actually holding it at a public library due to the fact that this library is in a center location. It's also where a majority of our individuals that are homeless tend to hang out during the day. So it's a perfect way to kind of get individuals that may really benefit from having Narcan um, with them. But the comment was, I don't understand why it's at a public library. Read a book. Oh, by the way, you won the door prize, Narcan. Um, let's see here. The mothers were, yeah, let's get the addicts who don't do anything in the community, community more incentive to keep doing the crap and bringing it to this area or to this area. Stupid. I'm not taking my kids to the library tomorrow. Um, seriously, how about we give out free insulin to people who actually need it instead of drug addicts who are going to turn around and do the stupid crap again that got them in the situation in the first place? So again, this is just a few of the comments that individuals responded in regards to this training that's actually going to help save lives. So a little bit about what we've actually done so far. Uh, since October, we've personally distributed 75 Narcan kits, um, again, to the general public during training at one of the local community centers. Um, every month they hold a Narcan training for individuals. Our local fire department, um, our faith-based treatment facilities uh, needed some Narcan. And then one of the most interesting, I believe, and you see that picture, is the McCray County short Corner. Um, she approached me after a meeting and inquired about getting Narcan and getting trained because they're seeing more and more overdose um, deaths in our area. And so the coroner and her staff are the ones that have to go out and investigate these situations. And with the rise of fentanyl in our area, they were more concerned about what they may be exposed to and, and so forth. And so they're actually uh, keeping Narcan for themselves. And then also in the case that an officer or someone else, um, family members of individuals that they are investigating, um, they just want to have Narcan on site with them. And then also our local strength, strength exchange um, right now is funding back in December and asked for some Narcan. So we were able to provide them with 12 kits. We've actually received word that one of those kits that we provided to the strength exchange was actually used to save a life um, of a young individual. Next slide, please. So again, um, what's next? So like I mentioned, we're holding a train um, that says you could save a lot. Um, we're having it at a public library, and we're really encouraging the public um, and family members, friends. We want this geared more towards the individuals who are going to be in situations where Narcan may be used. Um, we're also utilizing the Sentinel testing strip. Um, we're providing those because, again, in our area, um, Sentinel and report actually came out this past week from um, Millennium Health, and they actually uh, stated that Kentucky has the highest percentage of fentanyl positive drug tests in the country. Um, the state cocaine, meth, and heroin use is also among the highest in the U.S. So in Western Kentucky, we see more individuals that use methamphetamine, and, and we're seeing more and more individuals that are actually um, having methamphetamine that's laced with fentanyl or the um, counterfeit Xanax pills. And one of the counties, two counties over from us, about three weeks ago actually had four deaths as a result to the counterfeit um, Xanax pills that had fentanyl in it. And they're actually, they were actually able to trace it back to our service area. Um, so that was one of the other reasons why we felt the need to have a training. And what we're doing is every 20 minutes, we're actually hosting a Narcan training, we're going to um, provide them with Nar a box of Narcan, and then we're going to have local vendors uh, in regards to treatment, some of the recovery services, uh, prevention services in general, just to be able to link individuals out to ser uh, services they may need. We're also planning a substance use disorder treatment. It's called a Village of Care. This is um, to address more of our pregnant and prenatal 
Um, individuals, again, this area, we have a difficult time to reach the pediatricians and individuals. Um, if an individual is pregnant, they go through their OBGYN, drug testing is not being done. If it is being done, it's kind of just swept under the rug. And so we're really trying to educate the community on the importance of services for individuals. Women that are pregnant or prenatal or postpartum. So during that training, I'm actually going to be presenting on medication-assisted treatment. Uh, that audience is also targeted for our Department of Community-Based Services. And again, there's a lot of stigma associated with medication-assisted treatment, especially within that population. Um, they feel that it's just substitution instead of it actually being a valuable medication to use. And in addition, the hospital is going to talk about neonatal abstinence syndrome, the reporting laws, uh, again, the early childhood care in regards to trauma and um, how that can impact an individual's future. Um, two recovery coaches are also going to be present to share their story. And then at closing, we're going to have resources from our HANDS program, which is a program through the health department that actually go into the home. Um, they provide follow-up after um, the child is born uh, to just link the family with resources um, in the first steps and then Kentucky Moms Matter. Um, we're also going to do a naloxone phase loss and anti-stigma awareness campaign. Again, like I mentioned, we have a huge stigma. Um, and one of our um, Center Point Recovery Center for Men, which is actually one of those uh, Kentucky Recovery Centers, one of the staff members that works out there has actually been working with individuals across the state to develop letters of individuals that actually have been saved by Narcan. And these letters are a lot of times directed to law enforcement officers, the MPs, the individuals that at one point in the, the client's life may have thought were against them, but in reality, they were there to save their lives, and these letters are very, very powerful, and we're trying to figure out a way to kind of tie that into a region-wide campaign. And lastly, um, using evidence-based curriculums in school. So we're working with some of the area schools to, um, we've had some interest in the schools. They currently do the bottom and life skills for middle schoolers. And so one of our target groups is actually grades three through five, and so, we're trying to get the bottom and life skills implemented uh, for grades three through six. And if you're not familiar with that program, it looks at self-esteem, decision-making, smoking information, um, how advertisements can have an impact on a young person's life, dealing with stress, communication skills, social skills, and um, assertiveness skills. And next slide, I think it's, yep, and that is all. Okay, great. Thank you so much, um, Elizabeth. That, um, that um, I'm so glad that you had the opportunity that you uh, described the community's reaction to your um, upcoming naloxone training. I think hearing those comments from the community members, I think it really resonates with what a lot of other health centers are having to face with the stigma issues around naloxone and medica medicated assisted treatment. So um, it's it's nice to hear that and how you all have tried to address those with, with your campaign titles. I wanna ask um, anyone that is joining our call to in the chat box to in, insert some of the, the strategies that you've done to address stigma issues. I think it'd be great for us to hear. And I wanna ask um, Dr. Santos what, what he's done in Puerto Rico um, on that particular issue. And then we can go to the Q&A session. I'll just remind everyone, if you have a question, you can put it in the chat function or you can dial, you can raise your hand and uh, we can unmute your line. But Dr. Santos, can, did you have a, an issue with uh, stigma in your community? And if so, how did you all address it? We had to start with, uh, with our personnel. Uh, this is a primary care facility, and all of a sudden we started to treat people with substance use disorders. So we had to deal with the uh, prejudices of our our physicians, our nursing staff, and staff in general. 
towards this population. Uh, so what we did is we uh, did seminars at every one of our clinics, at all seven of them, and we uh, got our personnel together and we had full day seminars Ref, uh, in regards to what a substance use disorder is, that they understood that it is a disease and that anyone can have this disease in their family, regardless of their education or their, or their economic position. So we started with the personnel and then uh, with the community, well, basically, since we don't treat them differently, we don't have a specific clinic for our MAT patients, they sit and wait with everyone else in the waiting room and they go and see their physician that treats them for mat, treats them for mat but really nobody knows because they're fully integrated within their primary care facility and that's how we've dealt with that thank you so much i think we have a couple of questions in the chat box today can you um go through those yes um, so we have uh, two questions from Denise Freeman. Um, she says, in her first question, she says, she says, how can we get more psychiatric care, especially in-house for addicts without insurance? And her other question is, naloxine is merely an intervention from overdoses. What can we do to enhance long-term recovery? Is that a question for me? Um, it could be for you, for you or for our care as well. Well, I can address the psychiatric part. Okay. What, we, what we're doing. Uh, most of our patients are uh, basically Medicaid patients and uh, we, we provide them the psychiatric treatment that they need. It's, it's right within our facilities. We don't have to refer, so we're not worried about the billing part. So all of our patients receive psychiatric care, uh, regardless of their uh, of their health insurance or their uh, their socioeconomic position. And I, this is Frank Vega. I could speak to the <clears throat> issue about long-term recovery, uh, and and part of it is is that uh, we may actually need to uh, begin to redefine what we see recovery actually as being. Um, we know that. Uh, in working in substance use that uh, relapse is part of the uh, disease process. And so uh, beginning to reframe uh, uh, relapse instead of um, uh, insisting that the patient uh, start their recovery all over again, again, it's just part of the disease process. And so it's incumbent upon us to become more and more aware of um, uh, new and more innovative approaches to uh, substance use services. Um, AA and NA in their own literature publish that uh, or state that uh, up to 90% of individuals uh, uh, will attend one meeting and never come back. Well, if abstinence only is the only um, uh, means towards recovery, then a 90% fail rate uh, means that it's not an effective program. Uh, and so we have to uh, actually begin to redefine and use approaches like um, MAR, which is Medication Assisted Recovery Anonymous, um, and getting those types of efforts out there that really remove the stigma uh, that's attached to um, uh, recovery, ba uh, recovery using medication uh, assistance. Uh, and so it really pushes uh, those of us who are providers um, on the behavioral health side to expand the way that we uh, view uh, recovery to begin to embrace some of the newer approaches to uh, assisting individuals with uh, substance use issues um, <clears throat> and to um, uh, help individuals define recovery for themselves and not something that is um, uh, defined by anyone else. Um, I'd like to also talk just a little bit about the stigma issue that, uh, that Dr. Santos addressed with uh, staff. Um, one of our physicians uh, is in recovery, uh, and um, he talks about this very openly, and he's also one of our MAP providers. And when uh, he first began, or when we first talked with him about uh, working in our medication-assisted treatment program, um, his response was really, really negative because he had worked on his recovery uh, through abstinence. 
And this physician and I had a conversation and we talked about that it's not, medication assisted treatment is not to, to uh, is not the only step in recovery. Uh, medication assisted treatment is in place to keep people alive so that they can learn how to be in recovery for themselves. Uh, and so it's really important that we educate our providers about that uh, medication assisted treatment through the use of any buprenorphine based product um, is just a step towards recovery so that individuals can learn the coping mechanisms and skills that they need in order to address the underlying issues that may be present in, in their uh, addictive behavior. I absolutely agree with that. Sorry, there is one more question. Okay, Do go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, BJ. Okay. Um, so this is actually uh, somebody sharing uh, one of the strategies that they're implementing from Kelly Finstra. Uh, she says Michigan Primary Care Association developed a 12 month anti stigma campaign that we distributed to health centers. It was mainly targeted to health center staff, but some of the posters were meant to be hung in the patient waiting room. Now we have another question um, that says any ideas on how to address the social environment, close contacts, friends, dealers, in rural places, interpersonal ties that can be very strong? Elizabeth Yes. Any ideas on how to address the social environment, close contacts, friends, or dealers? In rural places, interpersonal ties can be very strong. This is Fraser with Corp. I'm, I'm happy to start if that would be helpful with the response to that. Sure. Great. So I. Um, I'll just say, and I encourage others to um, join in, but um, just that we see it important, we, we find it's important, especially in rural communities, to meet people where they're at. Um, and um, sometimes that means providing harm reduction um, uh, information or um, resources on treatment options um, to family members post overdose, that kind of thing. Um, um, whether that's someone's been brought to the ED or um, if um, EMS has arrived at someone's home, following up, um, a number of our implementation grantees include a kind of post overdose follow up, um, either by a peer or um, someone from the um, health organization to provide resources to those at the home where the overdose occurred or the setting where the overdose occurred. Um, and that can include naloxone um, distribution and other kind of um, harm reduction um, efforts and resources and information. Um, and the other thing I just want to say is um, in terms of that um, social connection and peer to peer, um, we have found that peer recovery coaches um, used in the way that I just described post overdose, but in other ways, um, particularly as care coordinators um, post um, incarceration or um, for patients coming out of an inpatient setting into outpatient setting, having a peer recovery coach, uh, someone with lived experience um, is really helpful for forming kind of new peer connections that are um, recovery focused rather than um, use focused um, and uh, making sure that that's a new peer and in an, in a supportive environment with connections to the resources available in the community. And I would just tag into what uh, Fraser just said is that uh, we're beginning to see a tremendous impact with our um, uh, peer recovery support specialist um, and, um, uh, you know, helping individuals that are entering into our medication assisted treatment program to actually um, uh, feel comfortable within a recovery community, uh, even though it may not be a recovery community that's based on uh, the same tenants as a, a medication uh, assisted recovery anonymous, but some of the um, traditional abstinence based programs, uh, but knowing that they have someone there that um, can bridge the gap for them or uh, uh, bridge that gap between the use of medication assisted treatment uh, for their recovery and an abstinence based um, 
support system. Uh, and that's one of the, the largest stigmas that we encounter. Um, we have had individuals turned away from um, uh, some of the traditional um, AA or NA meetings. Um, uh, I can give you an exa a specific example of where uh, we had one of our patients that uh, attended one of the well-established groups in, here in Little Rock, uh, an NA group, uh, and the um, leaders of the group um, found out that this person was using medication uh, to assist in their recovery and told them that they weren't serious about their recovery and that uh, once they stop, stopped using, they could come back. Um, and so those are some of the things that have to be addressed um, uh, in changing people, places, and things for the individuals that are seeking this type of services. Oh, I'd like to comment on something that what we do here. And one of the first things we tell patients when they come in is that uh, their recovery is not just the medication and that we prescribe medication to buy time so that they can enter into sobriety so that we can work with them in their life process and that that the medication isn't curative and what we do with it is buy time. And actually, <clears throat> what we do here in, in our program in CEDRA we refer them to another group that I have here in town. That's a support group that uh, uh, we get together three three nights a week, and we give uh, psychosocial, uh, psychoeducational lectures on um, Fridays. We do twelve steps on Mondays. Uh, we do uh, uh, by, uh, biblical readings on Wednesdays. It's it's a spiritual group because it, it's it's from my church. I'm a deacon in the Catholic Church, and we've had this program for the last 20 years. And we have people that are, have been well over a decade in recovery, in full recovery. And we treat them here at Gospel, but we also refer them to that support group that meets three times a week. So it's very, very intensive treatment. And we've had, we have a lot of people that are in long-term recovery. And we, of course, we, we greet them openly being on medically assisted treatment. I would also like to add to that. Sorry. I was going to I was gonna add to that too. No, One of the things here in actually Western Kentucky is that we have um, in Paducah a recovery community center. And this facility actually allows individuals to go there for support meetings. They have a computer lab where we'll, they will help the individual with job applications, resumes, and obtaining their GED, online skills. Um, they have certain nights that are just social nights. It's just a safe place for the individual to go to socialize, to make new friends versus the friends are going to the bars or some of the hangouts that um, would be accessible. Uh, so we found that that could be a very vital resource in our one of our communities. Absolutely. Okay, Thanks so much for that. We we have one more question. Um Fide, do you mind answering that? Yeah. Uh, asking that question please. Sure. Um the last question says how can I as a nonprofit not serving in this area help with education? How can a nonprofit help with education? Is that yes. Um, how can I, as a nonprofit, not serving in this area, help with this education? Uh, and I believe that um, by in this area they mean in the opioid um, epidemic area. Sure. Um, this is Fraser. I'm happy. I'm happy to put a plug in to look at our our core grantees, see who is awarded, if um, any of them are in your service area. Um, by all means, um, call them and see how you can help. Um, that, by definition, there are efforts going on um, all across the country, um, and um, they, the more the merrier. So, um, feel free to reach out. Okay, 
Okay, thank you so much. I would like to, uh, see we're five minutes over, so I want to be mindful of everyone's time. I'd like to thank every all of our wonderful speakers today and for everyone who submitted their questions. Um, I do have one quick plug. The National Center for Health and Public Housing is having a uh, national symposium this June. You can get more information about it on our website, but the call for abstracts and posters is now open and registration is open. And um, you can also go to our website for um, resources on um, previous webinars, publications, newsletters, and one-on-one -on -one training. You can sign up for our list serve and receive updates on different types of funding opportunities and updates from our federal partners. Um, and here is our social media, um, uh, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube um, addresses. So thank you again, contact information for all of our speakers. And again, I want to thank you all for your time and um, we'll speak to you again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.